Okay, so I, this morning I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how to tie those, all those loose ends together, because very often as Austrians, we tend to get stuck in the theory, right, and the very abstract theory, but how do we actually apply this in the real world? And can you actually, as an Austrian, can you be a good entrepreneur, for instance? How do you run a business? How do you, how do you see things in the marketplace as an Austrian compared to others? Right? Is there anything we can learn from Austrian economics? And of course, the answer is yes. Uh, but I'm going to tie, tie these things together and, and give you an idea of, of what it looks like in practice. Okay? But before we do that, uh, the more important thing is this, uh, my book. <coughs> if you don't have a copy, now it's free in the bookstore downstairs. So pick up your copy. And Brandon, the store manager, told me that you can just grab one from the shelf. And if there are not enough, then ask him. It's also free if you order one online. So, so whoever is watching this feed now or in the future, go to the Mises store and buy one because the price is zero. That's uh, much lower than the value. And of course, you can download it as well, both audiobook and uh, the PDF. Uh, I think it's available in English, Spanish, and Mandarin Chinese to download. So what are you waiting for? Get your copy today, that sort of thing. Well, you're waiting for the lecture, of course, but in the break, get your copy. All right, so the main problem in economics is really production. It might si sound dry and boring, but it really is not. Production is how we manage to satisfy more wants than Mother Nature can on her own, right? So we engage in all these productive activities in order to lessen, lessen uh, uh, scarcity and satisfy more wants for more people. That is the whole point, right? And how do we do that specifically? Well, by producing economic goods. And of course, if you remember uh, from earlier this week, Menger defined a good as that thing that we control, that we can use to satisfy the wants that we have, right? So we want to satisfy as high, uh, highly valued want as possible with a good, and therefore we have diminishing marginal utility and so forth, right? So it's, it's very core to what we do as Austrians. We want to produce more goods and better goods and more valuable goods. That's the whole point, right? And that's what the market does so beautifully and the state does not. Another thing that we should recognize is that production precedes consumption. That might not seem very strange, because very few of us have eaten the bread before it's baked. Oh, well, this is too early. <laughs> OK, so you have to produce it before you can consume it. Now, not everybody agrees. A Keynesian would say, well, I mean, it's not necessarily the case. Sometimes you can actually consume it before it's produced, that sort of thing. But the, the point is that you have to engage in the productive activities before there is anything to consume. And we know also that value is in the consumption act. Right? It's only when consumers pr uh, consume the thing that we know whether it has value or not. And that's the whole problem for entrepreneurs and producers in the marketplace, that we don't know how people will value this thing until they already have it and use it and they choose to buy it, okay? Now, in this process, entrepreneurship is what drives this process forward and, and, and makes the whole market uh, process progress. And we talked about this a little bit in, in my talk on regulations, how regulations sort of redirect the economy and the, the unfolding of it in different lower-valued trajectories. Now, the main issue in economic production can really be summarized using math. Yes, you heard that right. <laughs> this is how I do it. Uh, and that's all the math is going to be, so don't worry. You don't, you don't have to leave. So here, the point is that cost of production needs to be lower than the price and the price needs to be lower than the value. And what do I mean by that? Well, if this is the case, then it's successful production, right? Because then you've used uh, scarce means, the cost, to produce something that carries a market price that is higher than your cost, so you earn a profit. And then the value to the consumer, of course, is higher than the price they're paying, or they wouldn't buy it. So the problem here is that 
production happens in this direction. You have costs first, then you get the price, and after that, the consumer gets the value of it, right? The problem is, many people starting a business, they will think of their uh, undertaking in this sort of temporal terms, this sequential uh, process. So they will think, and this is a, a great way to fail if you want to start a business, to think, oh, what do, I, what do I want to produce? Oh, this thing. And you calculate the cost of it, and then you add your markup to it, your, your profit requirement, and that's the price. And then you go to the market and you go, ta-da, here's my stuff. And no one really knows if it's valuable or not. That's a great way of getting a lot of cost and having no idea whether you will actually be able to cover the cost. And the problem, of course, is this, that valuation goes the other way. And if you paid attention to these previous lectures, not only mine, but all the other ones, you would know that value is in consumption. The value of the means of production is due to their contribution to the value of the final good. Right? So this sort of is an imputation process, we call it, where the value of the final good gives value to those means used to produce that good all the way back to land and labor. Okay, well, there's more we can learn from this, of course. So, the first two terms that decides and determines uh, the profit for the entrepreneur, right? Because the cost is in money prices in the economy, and that's why we need a market, too, to produce those and determine those prices, right? With uh, entrepreneurs bidding for resources. And the price is also in monetary terms. So, you can calculate pretty easily what profit you're going to make by simply taking the revenue minus the cost. That's easy, right? That's the entrepreneur's part of the equation. Well, there's also a consumer profit, right? So the consumer gets the value of the good, and the cost to them is the price they're paying, or at least the value of the money they're giving up, right? There could be something else. In a non-monetary economy, it's not money they're giving up, it's like barter, some other stuff. It could be their time or whatever it might be. Right? But this, you see how this can be very helpful when you're uh, making decisions in the marketplace and how to think about things. I use this in my teaching to normies, uh, non-Austrians, and it, sort of to give them an idea of how, how to think about this in very, very simple terms. And you can elaborate on this like forever, but as long as you have this in mind, you're going to avoid a lot of mistakes. Okay, so when we have the entrepreneur here, the question then is, okay, what, what is entrepreneurship? And you heard Dr. McAfee earlier this week talk about entrepreneurship in all these different senses and its judgment and all, all these things. And of course, Austrian economics has not a theory of entrepreneurship, but several, several different uh, approaches to it. You have Kirzner and you have Lachman and you have Mises and you have whatever else. What is it? Well, to Mises, that's where I'm going to focus today, entrepreneurship is defined in human action as simply the bearing of uncertainty. Okay? And that's a praxeological definition. And you, he goes through the evenly rotating economy and things like that to prove what would the economy be like without uncertainty. And of course, uncertainty is included in every action. So that aspect of action is entrepreneurial which means that if I go to the bathroom, there's some uncertainty in whether I will make it, and if I will, if I will be able to figure out how to do it and all this stuff. So there's, that's sort of entrepreneurial, but in a very silly sense, right? That's not what we talk about when we talk about the marketplace. Uh, so what we talk about is really entrepreneurship in market production, which is a, a more important and more interesting thing. The problem there is the uncertainty of what you're producing what will the value be for consumers? Of course, the value is subjective too. So the value, we can't really define it and we can't really uh, measure it, but it will give us insight into what price they might be willing to pay, right? And, and in this, this uncertainty, the market provides the means to lessen this uncertainty because you, through the division of labor and especially the division of intellectual labor, as Mises calls it, um, which is entrepreneurship. You have all these different people with different views of what consumers might appreciate and what they will value. And they all compete with each other in trying to produce the highest value possible. And that, of course, the value you think you're going to be able to produce sets the limit for how much you will be 
willing to pay for the inputs, right? So again, you have that you have to buy the inputs first to, in order to produce the outputs, but the valuation of it is the other way around, right? So a, an entrepreneur should properly think about, oh, how, do I, how much do I satisfy consumers, the intended consumers, with this intended good? How can I tweak it in such a way that it satisfies people to the most possible degree? And then, what price will that actually carry in the marketplace? What price will they be willing to pay for it? And then, can I keep my costs below this level or not? Okay. And the, this, of course, gives rise to economic calculation, because it's the bidding of entrepreneurs that determines the prices of the means of production. So entrepreneurship is, is super core to Austrian economics. And I'm not saying this only because I'm an entrepreneurship professor. <laughs> That's also part of the reason. But, <clears throat> but it, it is core to understanding the market as a process, as we do in Austrian economics. It's not just a supply and demand, right? OK, but there's more to it, right? Just uncertainty, just like my going to the bathroom is not very interesting. And how do we distinguish that from running a business and from disrupting the economy and that sort of thing and changing things up and creating economic growth? Believe it or not, but my successfully going to the bathroom is not going to create economic growth. So there's something more to it, right? So Mises has a narrower definition of entrepreneurship or a narrow, narrow, narrower conception of entrepreneurship, which he calls the entrepreneur promoter. And the promoter is, is this force or this, this function of creating something new and disrupting the economy, OK? And this is what creates economic growth. It's not just the reallocation of resources between uh, different types of production that are already in place, but it's the creation of a new type of production, a new type of good that is going to change things up and provide consumers with much more value. This is the driving force. And the driving force, of course, creates uncertainty. Because if you're starting a business and you're copying others, that's not a whole lot of uncertainty. Or maybe we can at least conceive of it as less uncertain as some than something else. So if you're starting a new dry cleaning business or a new McDonald's, what is the uncertainty? Well, you can fail, but it's not like creating a completely new good that no one has ever seen before, right? But given that there's someone might disrupt the whole thing, so maybe within the next year, someone will come up with the idea of a new type of food, and after that, no one is interested in buying burgers. Well, then the promoter actually increases the uncertainty for other entrepreneurs. So you have both at the same time, right? Because of the division of intellectual labor, it lessens and reduces uncertainty for everyone, but the promoter increases uncertainty too because you, don't re you can't really trust whatever it is. You have to always focus on the future. Okay, so to give you an idea of what Mises actually said here, here's from Human Action. He had a little bit of a problem, right? That the, the entrepreneur promoter he couldn't really define it praxeologically because it, there was like no way of taking it from the concept of action and deriving, oh, the promoter compared to non-promoter entrepreneurs. What, how do you do that? So he says that this is, the promoter is a concept that economics cannot do without because it explains economic growth. It explains the progression of the market economy, but he couldn't define it. And of course, this, this sucks, to put it in, in the Misesian terms, <laughs> because he, the way he puts it is that the driving force of the market, the element tending toward unceasing innovation and improvement, is provided by the restlessness of the promoter and his eagerness to make profits as large as possible. So you can see how it is the driving force, but if you can't define it, then we're in trouble. right? But we can, we can still talk about it. Of course, in practice, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, OK, so what is the driving force? Well, Mises uses different ways of, of sort of describing what, what the driving force of the promoter actually is. And he's talking about, like you saw on the previous slide, unceasing innovation and improvement. The promoter is the pioneer. Uh, the promoter is responsible for the great adjustments to the economy. So it's producing these new goods, and then the whole economy has to adjust to it. So think of the iPhone or think of Henry Ford's Henry Ford's uh, Model T, that sort of thing. It completely disrupts things. 
like people think differently about and they of course change their behavior too because something new more valuable appears on their value scales and they're able to afford it well then they're gonna screw the horse and carriage I can get a car right and screw the flip phone and the paper maps because I can get an iPhone that sort of thing it changes people's behavior this of course determines the structure of production too because uh, there are new uses found for the means of production and they are used in different ways toward different ends which means that they have different value as well right so this gives you a little bit of a different taste of entrepreneurship than is the case in other entrepreneurship theories within Austrian economics so Kersner is one being alert to opportunity and he's written a, a, a book chapter on on how entrepreneurship is about error correction. So there's late, there are latent errors in the marketplace because we're not in equilibrium, basically. And the, what the entrepreneur does is solves at least in part those errors and therefore pushes us closer to equilibrium. Well, with a promoter, that's a little bit different because the promoter will invent and imagine new ways of satisfying consumers. It's not really about errors anymore. And the same thing with Hayek. Hayek is talking about how entrepreneurs respond to changes in the prices. Well, the promoter disrupts the price, the, the price structure that exists and changes prices the way they are. So this is also different. And I would claim that it's also different from judgment. It means sure there's judgment involved, but the promoter uh, does more than simply have good judgment and can bear uncertainty. There's something more to it. Um, so it's not about simply reallocating resources between the productions and, and, and figuring out minor improvements. It's about introducing co something completely new. Okay, so if you're interested in, in the promoter uh, and, and what that means and so forth, I have written a, a little bit on that. So I have a, a paper in the Quarterly Journal of Economics from 2020 where I uh, draft a praxeological definition of it. Um, basically proving Mises wrong, but, well, I want to be modest. <laughs> and, and there's a book chapter from 2022 where I sort of prove how the promoter makes our conception of the market process different. It, it sort of disrupts not only the economy, but also our theory of the economy. And then I will continue to, and or I do continue to develop those ideas in a book that is uh, going to be published next year. Okay, so let's move to what does entrepreneurial production actually entail? And what does that mean for our conception of the firm? And especially perhaps how to run a firm and what managers do and that's sort of the practice of it all. So if you think about it, the conception that we had before, cost, price, value. Entrepreneurs understand this. Most entrepreneurs who have some experience as entrepreneurs, whether they failed or not, they are Austrians, they just don't know it. Okay, so here's one, Henry Ford, and he said, if I, well, there's uh, some question of whether he actually said it, but it's a great quote anyway. So he, he could have said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Because it's not the case that you go out there and you ask consumers, how can I satisfy your wants better? And they go, well, this type of product would be great. You go, oh, cool, I'll produce that, and then they will buy it because then there's really no uncertainty, right? And that's not how consumers act either. Instead, the promoter steps ahead and imagines that this type of good would probably satisfy people better, and they have no conception of it. And just like he says here, most people were using a horse and carriage before the Model T, so if they would ask people, how can I make your lives better? They would said, faster horses, or a horse that doesn't poop as much, or whatever it might be, right? But he had a different idea. His idea was, how about a carriage without a horse? Well, no consumers thought of that because they thought of, probably thought that was silly, right? But of course they bought it when they saw it. And here's a more modern uh, entrepreneur, but also dead. Uh, I hear dead white men is, is the way to go nowadays. So, <laughs> This is Steve Jobs, uh, Apple Computers, right? It's really hard to design products by focus groups. So it's something that you do in businesses, right? You invite consumers and then you have them talk about their feelings and their reactions to a product. And it's a helpful tool, 
but you can't really ask them to design the product. You can only ask for their reactions to the product. Because their imagination is of how to satisfy their wants is, is very limited. Most of us cannot imagine the exact product and how to produce it, because that's part of it, right? The economic calculation of it. So we can respond to it, and we do that all the time, and we find new value, right? When you go to the store, you might have a grocery list or whatever, but then you see, oh, that thing is on sale, or oh, that looks really tasty, and you just change your mind because you respond to the, the offers and, and the products that are available, okay? And that's the, the problem with entrepreneurship, of course. So what do entrepreneurs do in production? Well, they imagine, organize, and produce a good that consumers will find of greater value than any other goods that will exist in the future. See the, the emphasis on the future? Because the, that is what the uncertainty that entrepreneurs bear. It is, what, are the, what does the future market look like? And will I earn a profit in this future market with this product that I intend to produce? And it's the case even if you are producing something that already exists, because you don't know because of the potential for disruption, that whatever you could sell a ton of today, you can actually sell in a year. Right? Because the market might have changed, the situation might have changed, people's behavior has changed, things like that. Right? So the point is that the entrepreneur must attempt to foresee and act to exploit the future market conditions. And this is the uncertainty bearing of it. Okay, so what how do we think of, or how can we think of this uncertainty then? Well, I had a paper that I failed to publish. It's still good. But where I try to figure out, okay, so what is, if we would decompose uh, the value problem for the consumer, how do they actually figure out the value of a product and in, in the ways that matter to the entrepreneur, right? Well. The first thing, of course, is that you have to provide them with a good that they value. Nothing else, right? Does it satisfy their want? That's number one, right? That's pretty easy. Well, the second is, is it better than other goods that satisfy the same want? In that situation, of course. Right? So there are other goods that do the same thing, and they're obviously substitutes. Is my good better, in some sense? so that they will buy my good instead of other goods. But that's not all, right? Just because you have a want and there are means to satisfy it doesn't mean that you want to satisfy that want. <laughs> there are other wants too. So the question is, do you offer a good that satisfies a want that is of sufficient value to the consumer that they will choose that over satisfying other wants that are also possible to satisfy with goods in the marketplace? It makes it a little more complex, right? Because now you're competing for consumers' money with everybody else selling stuff. And that is what entrepreneurs do. They're not just competing with producers of substitutes. They're competing with anything. Actually, there's more to it as well. Because there's also, will the consumer act to satisfy that want now? Or will the consumer think, that, nah, I think there's a better opportunity to satisfy my want if I wait? if I save this money, and if I, if I save and buy something bigger and more expensive a year from now, or maybe you've, you think that there will be a better good, the next generation of the iPhone, iPhone 34, uh, will, will be better than 33, or whatever it is, okay? That's the problem that, that uh, consumers have. Of course, we don't think in terms of this, right? We just think, of, is this worth my money? Because we already have all this experience of, acting in the marketplace, so we don't actually have a value scale with all the possible goods on it. We don't have a, a list of all the ones that we want to satisfy and, and how we rank them. Instead, we just respond because we have all this information sort of latently in our minds. Okay, so what does this tell us, or this uh, entrepreneurial production? How do, how do entrepreneurs go about actually putting this together? Because it's not the case that you just go online and then, and then you just uh, buy stuff from that guy, from that guy, and they put it together, that's a, that's a good, right? There's much more to it. Well, that brings us to the firm. Now, what is a firm? That's something that economists have talked about for 
100 years, and they still have no good answer, which in part is because they're asking the wrong question, and in part, of course, is as long as you don't answer the question, there's more work to do, and therefore a job. But there is, of course, an answer to it, right? So first of all, we must recognize that the firm is not just something that emerges or something that is created because the equations say so. No, it's something that someone has to purposefully create. And who is that someone? That's the entrepreneur, right? So they have to create it for a purpose. And what is it? Well, you are trying to orchestrate a certain type of production of something that you think will be valuable, something that consumers will consider a valuable good. It's oriented towards the creation of this value for consumers. That has to be the case, right? It's not a response to something other than maybe the imagination by the entrepreneur, right? In this firm, yes, you collect resources, you collect labor, you, you put things together and you, you draft the process and you try it out and all this stuff, right? Well, in this firm, the entrepreneur hires the manager. So the manager is there to run the business, but focus on the efficiency and the effectiveness of production in the business. So now you can see the difference between entrepreneurship and management, right? The entrepreneurship is about figuring out what is the value? And then put together a way of producing that value, just making sure that the cost stays, hopefully, below the value, right? So, so that you can actually make a profit. Are there ways to tweak this idea and make it better, more efficient? Duh. Of course, the first try is not optimal. So what do you do? Well, you hire someone who is really good at tweaking things and figuring out how to cut costs and maybe increase output or, or tweak the product a little more. Because you've already, that's when you've already uh, discovered that there is an opportunity for profit here because this new good will be of value, right? So you hire the manager. The manager works within the realm of what the entrepreneur has defined and tries to lower the cost, okay? So in a sense, what the manager does is extends the life of the profitability of whatever the entrepreneur put together, right? Because entrepreneur, if it's valuable, if, it's not, if it doesn't earn a profit and you don't think that it's gonna earn a profit, well, what do you do? You kill the business because it's just a waste of resources and a waste of time. But if it actually makes a profit, well then what the manager does is extends that profit opportunity because by cutting costs and increasing output and continue to tweak and improve the product, you can continue to earn profits until either you have exhausted that opportunity so no one wants the product anymore or someone disrupts the business and offers something that is much valuable, more valuable, right? So you can see now also that the firm is a temporary way of of uh, satisfying people's wants, right? This is not my idea, this is something that Mises talks about too, and he, he says that the manager is a junior partner of the entrepreneur. It's hired by the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is whoever has his ass on the line, pretty much, right? If there is a loss, who bears that loss? Who has to cover it? Well, the entrepreneur. Then you can share the profits with the manager and so forth, fine. But that just shares the function of entrepreneurship, right? And creates all these weird in incentives as well, or disincentives. Okay, so what does this tell us then <clears throat> about the firm itself, what it does? Well, the way I have conceived of it is, or try to explain it, is as an island of specialization. Because how do you produce a new type of good or, or, or satisfy a new satisfy a want in a new way with a new type of good. Well, you had to figure out how to produce it. And you had to figure out a new combination of resources, as Schumpeter would put it. And probably you need to uh, create new capital, new types of machines, new types of tools. You had to educate people to do the right things within your new process, which of course will change, uh, change in time with the manager tweaking uh, the whole thing, right? But the point is that this is a new type of specializing within the firm. People are doing things and they have expertise that is specific to producing this new good that didn't exist before. You couldn't just, Apple, when they, when they released the first iPhone, they couldn't advertise for uh, iPhone experts 
to help with manufacturing and design, because there were no such, no such, such thing. They were experts on different parts of the technology, yes, but what about putting it together and figuring out how to make it more valuable to people? That wasn't an expertise available. You had to develop that in-house, right? And the same thing with the production process. You had to do a lot of innovation within the production process in order to put this new type of good together. It's not just, it's, entrepreneurship is not about just putting uh, Lego pieces together and build something, right? It's about creating new types of Lego pieces. Uh, and if you remember uh, Dr. Engelhardt's discussion on game theory, how do entrepreneurs solve the problems in game theory? They create new rules. They step outside of the box, right? That's what they do in the economy. It's not only in game theory, okay? So it's a, the firm is a way for the entrepreneur to create this new type of good that will hopefully satisfy uh, new wants, okay? And I elaborate on this in, in my book from 2015, The Problem of Production, which is much more fun than it sounds. Okay, so if we summarize this, this process from an Austrian perspective, what does it look like? Um, like this, or at least that's one way of putting it, right? I've numbered the thing so, you can walk, so we can walk it through, right? So the first thing that happens is the entrepreneur imagines a new type of good and imagines that this will be of value to consumers. So there will be consumers who satis who, whose wants are satisfied. They are left better off if they get this good. How much? Most value is subjective. We can't measure it, but it's got to be a lot, right? Or otherwise there's no point in it. Is that exactly the product that they're going to produce? No, because there are other concerns, right? And maybe you can't produce it exactly the way you wanted to do it, and maybe the cost is too high, so you tweak it, whatever. But because of that, the entrepreneur puts together all these resources and starts the process of producing, that's the firm, right? So two, creates the firm and hires or appoints a manager within the firm to run the firm. Could be the same person, right? Very often in a startup, the entrepreneur is the manager. Also very often uh, in the startup, at some point you need to get rid of the entrepreneur because it's just screwing things up because you need someone who's good at management. And the entrepreneur is the visionary who imagines this new good and, wow, this would be fantastic if consumers would get this thing because it would change their lives. Okay, well, the manager says, that, that's a little too costly. We should cut it down a little bit and make it more uh, mass market friendly, whatever it might be, right? So the, he or she uh, appoints the manager for the firm. The firm is the whole production process or this island of specialization that produces the product. And as you can see, I actually thought this through, the product that is produced is different from the product imagined, right? Different shape, different color. It's not necessarily exactly the same thing, but it's the same idea that has sort of evolved. And then with all these other concerns, uh, has changed a little bit, but hopefully gets close enough to satisfying the want. At that point, the consumer gets involved. Because right? that's when you offer it to consumers and you have tried to figure out a good price for it. Well, the consumer has never seen it before. Might never have heard of you. Is it worth the money to buy the good? Well, that's for them to decide. That's what consumer sovereignty means. Right? That the entrepreneur will make all these investments and create the firm and produce the product and tweak it and do whatever. Involve the consumer as much as possible just to learn from them. But still, even if the consumer says, yeah, that's worth $100, and then you produce a product and go, here you go, $100, please. Usually they go, nah. So they, they change their minds and they have different views, right? So talking, talk is cheap, right? So they have to act on it or we won't make a profit. Now here you can see too then that where should you start when you start a business? Obviously you start with the consumer's valuation of the end product. You don't start with the cost. If you start with the cost, you're screwed. And I would claim that most entrepreneurs fail because they start at the wrong end in thinking about the business. And if you study entrepreneurship, all of these little models and rules and, and frameworks and everything that are taught are really taught to try to figure out not how the, is this product valuable to you, 
but to the intended customer. How do you put the customer first? Right? How can you place yourself in the customer's shoes and make sure that you maximize the value for them? Okay, so let's look at the Austrian business in practice. Obviously, if all business owners were Austrians, there would be very few failures, lots of profit. Uh, we would already have uh, vacationing to Mars and Jupiter. Well, whatever. At least the businesses would be better, right? Or that's my claim. So the Austrian business, it begins and ends with the consumer. Because the conception of the whole thing begins with the consumer's wants and the, per the perception of and the imagination of the value that this thing will have with, or service, whatever it might be, has for the consumer. The consumer decides whether to buy it or not. So the consumer gives you the profit if you've done well enough. If you recall the cost price value thing, right? You're, it's easier to sell the good the lower the price that you, that you demand for it because that increases the difference for the consumer value and price, right? The lower the price, greater the profit for the consumer. The problem there is, of course, that you still have costs and you have to cover those costs with the price. You have, so it's your job to try to figure out sort of the, the golden middle Okay, so the Austrian business also must focus on the whole experience. It's not about the thing. We know it has to do with the want, right? The satisfaction that they get from it. The satisfaction from something is not just the thing itself. It's the use of the thing and the whole experience, right? It's the selling experience, the, the follow-up and the support and things like that, right? So even the price is part of this experience. What does the price tell you? in terms of the value of the product. What would happen, do you think, if, if they would start selling Porsches for $5,000? Well, we'd not, not be a prestigious car anymore, right? So actually the value for at least some sub-segment of the market would be lower because the price is lower, because the price signals something, and it keeps the riffraff out from being Porsche owners or whatever it is, right? But it has to be low enough for consumers to make a profit, it has to be high enough to cover the cost, but it also signals different things, depending on who you're focusing on, right? So the price has to be a decision by the entrepreneur. It's not, I, there's a strike through there, right? The cost plus method, which is something that they teach in MBA programs. And that's a terrible thing to teach because it's brainwashing in sort of the worst way. Because what it teaches is that, oh, you just, you want to produce this good, you calculate the cost, and you add the profit markup to it. That's exactly the wrong way of doing it. And yes, plenty of businesses do it, and they can sort of do it because they are acting within a sea of market prices. But you can't do it as a, as a promoter. You can't do it as a disruptor entrepreneur, right? Because you don't know. And just adding a markup to the cost the way they are, with your good being much, much better and more valuable than any other good, well, that means you're giving the consumer a lot of profit, but you might signal the wrong thing, and you could get more from it as well. Right? So, you, so cost plus, plus pricing, whenever you hear that, run, scream, all this stuff. Get out of it. OK, what else? Well. We, can, we also learn that entrepreneurs, must pre, they must prefer market prices because market prices are determined by all the other entrepreneurs, right? So it's spreading the risk in a sense, which means also that if you start a business and you include all these different things within your business, you can't really tell, oh, the accountant I hired in the startup of, of 200 people is the accountant contributing to the bottom line of the business. Well, how would you know? There's no way of knowing, right? But if you buy it in the market, you know exactly what the cost is, and you can tell immediately, is it worth it? Because you're paying the price of it. So an, a, an Austrian entrepreneur would actually minimize the scope of the business to the degree possible and use the market prices for calculation to make sure that you're actually making a profit and you're actually using things in the most efficient manner, right? So in a sense, that means Whenever you can, and it, it doesn't imply a huge risk for your business, outsource. 
outsource as much as possible. Stay with and stick to and focus on the actual value creation, not these other uh, additional services. OK, so the main task of the entrepreneur is just to imagine how to satisfy consumers. Of course, that involves production and, and technology and, and all this other stuff too, but it is about the value. And you bear the uncertainty of it. Any investment and production implies speculation. OK, so there are two. Um, I want to end with just asking a couple of questions. Because how, how do we distinguish between the entrepreneur and the manager in sort of real life or in practice? Well, they ask different questions. They try to answer different questions about the marketplace. So the entrepreneur, as you have up here, is how can I best serve consumers? And it's not being a servant, it's not being a slave or anything like that. It's not doing something that you hate doing. But it is how can I, to the best possible degree, provide something of value to consumers? And can I make it profitable? Do I enjoy doing it? And all those things too, right? But how can I create more value? Because as you saw in, in, in the, the blue thing, you have to create more value than all the substitutes. You have to create more value than other product offerings in the market. And you have to create enough value for consumers to choose to buy something now. So focusing on the value is what the entrepreneur does. Management, in turn, answers two questions. And as you can see, the, it's limited by what the entrepreneur has answered already and put together. Right? So question one is, how can we strengthen the firm's value proposition to consumers? Which is, how do we tweak uh, the product? It's information you get when you start to sell the product. But of course, production precedes consumption. So you've already produced a bunch of them. But then you learn from the feedback, and you can update for the next generation. And you know whether they will have a, want a bigger or smaller one, a heavier one with more gadgets in it, or uh, uh, whatever it might be. Like, where are consumers at? What would they value more? But for that one opportunity, OK? And how can I operate this firm in practice more profitably? Which means, in the first question, we've already tried to increase the value of the product, the product that the entrepreneur envisioned by tweaking it. So this question focuses on the cost. Right? How can we cut the cost while maintaining the value of what is produced? So in, in a sense, increase the difference between the cost and the price. Right? But with the price probably being fairly stable. So how do you, how do you reduce the cost while keeping the value basically the same? Because right? if the value falls, it's going to be harder to sell. So again, it's that equation. Right? So I, hopefully, you have a better idea of how to think about a business from an Austrian perspective. You can see it's, it sort of uncovers how business works and what entrepreneurs do in a sense that you definitely don't get from mainstream economists. And you also don't get in most management courses and things like that that you take. Okay? But the Austrian perspective really releases uh, sort of an, and uncovers the logic behind creating new businesses, creating value. And you can see where economic growth comes from. Right? If this is what entrepreneurs do, they imagine new and greater value for consumers, and they compete by creating this newer value, well, obviously, we're going to become better off as a result. Right? That's pretty obvious. And that now it's also obvious, I hope, why regulations have such a long-term uh, disastrous effect. I'm not saying that there should be no regulations whatsoever. It's just that we have to, have to uh, consider the actual real cost of regulations. OK, so I'll end with like last time with a list of my books. Uh, please buy them. The, the orange one, of course, is free downstairs. Thank you.